Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Danielle Ryan and I'm a conservation campaigner with the with the National Parks Association of New South Wales. Uh, we're really excited because we have Saren Lone uh, here to join us tonight from the Environmental Defenders Office. Uh, we're going to be uh, talking about uh, pretty much the art of submission writing. Um, here at the National Parks Association, we really want to help drive that campaign to protect a third of the land in the sea by 2030 and submission and uh, proposals for new protected areas can really help us um, to, as a tool to help get to that uh, magic number. Um, so we're really excited to have Saren here to tell us a bit about the art of writing proposals and submissions. Uh, she is a solicitor at the Environmental Defenders Office in Sydney and she started there in January 2019 and is currently working in the EDO's nature team. Her work includes writing law reform proposals, engaging with government on draft policy and legislation and providing legal advice to EDO clients on a range of environmental issues including biodiversity, conservation, environment and planning and natural resource management. Previously, Sarin worked as an in-house lawyer for government for a not-for-profit human rights organisation in Mongolia and as most recently as a policy and research coordinator with the New South Wales Nature Conservation Council. Wow, it looks like you have an amazing background with lots of experience experience in this area. Uh, so Sabrina, I'm going to hand it over to you um, so you can deliver a presentation. And then afterwards, we'll follow up with a, a Q&A. Uh, in the meantime, if anyone does want to type into the chat uh, who they are, where they're from and why they're here, uh, it also just helps to give us an idea of who's joining us here tonight. So thank you for join, joining us. Sarin, over to you. Thanks, Danielle. Good evening, everyone. Saren Lone here from the Environmental Defenders Office. Uh, I think uh, a message was just put in the chat. If you were expecting to see my colleague Jem here tonight, sorry to disappoint you. You've got my face. Um, Jem's unwell today and has asked me to step in at the last minute. Uh, fortunately, this is a topic I love talking about, so hopefully I'll do it some justice and be able to answer any questions that you've got tonight. Uh, I'm calling in from Durrawal country on the south coast of New South Wales. I pay my respects to Durrawal elders past and present, and I extend that to um, the lands for all, from which you're all calling into this webinar tonight. Now, um, some of you may have joined uh, the recent webinar that Jem did uh, on biodiversity laws and how they can be used to protect biodiversity. Uh, if you did join that, welcome back to this one. Um, if not, um, I think that one's probably going to be available through NPA anyway, if you want to catch up on, on those, um, what Jem had to say about that. Uh, but in this webinar tonight, we're going to be covering off on key advocacy skills. So we've split the presentation uh, into kind of two themes. The first one will be looking at proactive advocacy, and that's the kind of things that you might want to do off your own back to engage with decision makers or government um, around key issues that you're concerned about. And the second half of the presentation will be talking more about reactive advocacy, where you're actually engaging in formal government processes that are being led by government and uh, responding to information that they might have put out for public consultation, um, et cetera. So uh, as Danielle mentioned, please put your questions in the Q&A throughout the presentation. Um, we've got some side time set aside at the end of the night to discuss these. Um, if we don't get to all the questions, then uh, Gem and I are happy to take them on notice and try and um, put something in writing back to MPA that they can distribute to the webinar participants. Uh, so next slide, please, Sam. So just a quick note um, in terms of uh, the information that we're providing tonight. Um, it's not legal advice, it's just some legal information through our legal outreach program. And so if you do have a need for legal advice and you can always get in touch with us directly, our website's there on the screen and, and we might be able to uh, assist you with providing some um, legal advice in relation to any specific facts or circumstances that you're interested in. Next slide, Sam. So we're talking about proactive advocacy. You can probably move through to the next one too. Um, 
So uh, in the last webinar, Jem uh, spoke to you about um, the various processes that exist under both New South Wales and Commonwealth laws to list threatened species or heritage items or special places um, as protected under the various legislation. I think um, you know, threatened species list, heritage protection lists, and also um, their category of areas of outstanding biodiversity value, which is kind of a, a new concept for critical habitat under the new Biodiversity Conservation Act. Um, and so I'm going to talk now about how you might engage in the process of putting forward either a threatened species or a heritage item or an area for protection under various laws. Now, the rules are going to be a little bit different depending on um, which pathway you're going down, what you actually want to do, but the information is um, pretty consistent um, across the field. So the first thing is to find out what information is available on the government website to explain the process. So most of the processes um, will have some kind of formal component that's set out in the legislation. For example, there might be criteria that the decision maker has to consider when making a decision. And so the process for nominating something should address that criteria. There might also be specific government requirements that they, they ask in addition to the legislation. For example, that you use a certain form or that you um, upload it on a certain website, et cetera. So the best starting place is to have a look at the relevant government agency's website to find out what information they have there. And most of it's pretty um, straightforward and easy to follow and is the best way to kind of figure out what you need to do. So start off by reading that information. And then once you've got an idea of what, what to do, then you need to think about what evidence you are able to su provide to support your nomination. So you can get that evidence from various places. You might um, have scientists or experts that you're working with who can provide some evidence. Uh, you know, might be part of a conservation group that has lots of information on hand. There might be government reports that you can rely on to demonstrate the points you wanna get through. But the idea would be to try and address the relevant criteria that the decision maker needs to consider by providing some concrete evidence of why you think a species should be listed as threatened or why you think a certain place should be protected under the relevant law. Um, other than that, it's pretty straightforward. EDI can always, you know, assist you with understanding the law and the processes or where you need to go to find information. But we don't actually um, make nominations ourselves. We assist clients to do that. If you're really keen, then we'd suggest maybe speaking to some organisations that have actually done this themselves and one example that we've got here is Humane Society International so they've done quite a few threatened species nominations in their own right and so you know you're always free to contact them and see if they've got any tips um, etc for to put putting forward something for nomination. I think we've also got a fact sheet um, online that I can you know send through to MPA to share with participants later around um, the Commonwealth and New South Wales processes for threatened species in particular so that might help people as well. Um, okay, I'll leave it there. As we said, pop any questions you might have in the chat and we'll move on to the next topic. Great, thanks, Sam. So now we're going to talk a bit about um, asking the minister to call in a project. So just by way of background, what I'm talking about here is um, the process by which um, you may be able to ask the Commonwealth Environment Minister to consider whether a project needs approval under the Commonwealth EPBC Act. And so this might be relevant where there's a proposal in New South Wales that may impact on a um, threatened species or on a, a, a particular ecological area that you know, has significant impact, uh, so, sorry, significant values, and you think that the activity is going to have um, an impact on those values. Um, you'll need to have, the project will need approval under New South Wales laws, but in some cases it may also need approval under federal laws. Now the, the project proponent is meant to refer that project to the Commonwealth Minister for a decision as to whether or not it needs to be considered under the EPBC Act. But sometimes proponents may not do that. They may not do that because they've formed a view 
that it won't have a significant impact and you might disagree with that view. Um, they may not be aware of the rules, although you would expect them to, especially if they've got you know, experts helping them prepare their environmental assessment and their application, or they may have kind of hedged their bets and you know, not referred it in the hope that others have formed a similar view to them that it doesn't have a significant impact on a matter of national environmental significance. But if you, you know, if you disagree and you think a proposal could be um, needed to be referred under the EPBC Act, then you could always contact the federal minister yourself and ask them to use their powers under the Act to call that process in and make a decision about whether it needs to be um, assessed under the EPBC Act. Um, so, the way you might go about doing that is to simply write to the minister and ask them, but you probably want to include enough information in there for the minister to form a decision about whether he or she should use her powers. So the first thing you'd want to do is introduce yourself or the group that you're writing on behalf of, say that you're aware that there's a project that may not have been or has not been referred to the minister and request that the minister use their powers under Section 70 of the EPBC Act to call that project in. It's also helpful to explain why you think that that project is likely to have a significant impact on a matter of national environmental significance. Now, if you're not familiar with the EPBC Act, I should just mention that a matter of national environmental significance is not an arbitrary term. It's actually something that's identified in the EPBC Act. It could be a threatened species, for example, or a national heritage site or something like that. So you need to first make sure that the thing that you think is going to be impacted is actually um, identified in the legislation as a matter of national environmental significance. The other thing you need to be able to do is demonstrate that you think that there would be a significant impact on that matter of national environmental significance, because that's kind of the crux of the way that the, um, the act is triggered. And so the department has significant impact guidelines that they've published on the department's website um, that explain to you um, whether an action may or may not have a significant impact on a matter of national environmental significance. So you can use that guideline as a way to um, consider the issue and point out any factors in the guide that would be relevant to whether or not the um, the project that you've concerned about would have an impact on a matter of national environmental significance. Now, it's not essential that you provide, you know, concrete expert evidence to support you, but if you happen to have that information on hand, like an expert's opinion on the impacts of a proposal or um, other information that's, you know, reliable, you could attach that information, you know, to your letter to the minister to kind of give, give your argument a bit more weight. Finally, what you want to do is um, conclude with a clear statement and a recommendation. You want to um, clearly explain why you think that this proposal needs to be referred to the minister and ask the minister directly to use her powers to call it in. The other thing I wanted to say about this particular process is that there's also the ability for a state or territory to refer a matter to the minister. And so that's that particular section relates to projects that may also um, be under consideration by a state government. So the state government has a role to play as well. Then the state government is able to refer the matter to the Commonwealth Minister. So if you, um, one other option might be to liaise with your state department or your state minister and ask them to use that power themselves to refer the matter directly to the Environment Minister. Might leave that one there. Again, pop any questions in the chat that you might have about that and we'll move on to the next slide. Thanks, Sam. Meeting with politicians are oh, one of my favourite things to do. Um, I'm sure some people on the call have, have done this before, but we just thought we'd um, provide some, you know, some tips or suggestions for how you might want to go about doing this. The first thing I'd say is that um, it's notoriously difficult to get a meeting with a minister. So don't be too disheartened if, you know, if on your first try, they politely decline to meet with you is always to give it a go but another option might be to start with your local MP and see if your local MP can assist and then you know you could elevate it to the minister from there and it kind of gives the minister um, if you can say to the minister look we've contacted our local member this is what they've had to say or they've suggested we got in contact then it will kind of you know stop the minister from suggesting back to you that you just go to your local MP so what you want to do um, 
if you'd like to meet with the minister, is just send a short, succinct letter or email with a meeting request explaining why you want to meet with them and the issues that you want to discuss. Uh, it's probably good to keep it short and sweet. You can go into more detail in the meeting and provide, you know, briefing notes or other material to the minister in the meeting. Um, if the minister or your local MP doesn't agree to meet with you, then, you know, a short um, option in response might be to, you know, reach out to the media and kind of raise the, the issue in the media and say, look, we've reached out to the MP, local MP or the member and they've, they haven't agreed to meet with us and maybe that will put a little pressure on the minister or your local MP opening their door to you. Um, the other thing that's quite useful is if you um, team up with other individuals or groups who um, share similar concerns and that way you can demonstrate that the concerns that you have, you know, are broad and come from a wide range of the community. And then it also gives the minister an option to meet with multiple groups at the same time, which might be um, appealing to their diary manager who's trying to juggle, juggle their appointments if they're able to get, you know, a number of groups with a common interest in the room at the same time to talk through that. Uh, the other thing we would say is um, don't just think about meeting with government throw the net wider and uh, consider meeting with the opposition, um, shadow ministers or independents. You might find some of those people are more sympathetic to your cause and can be a champion for the issues that you're concerned about within the parliament um, and more broadly within the community. Um, once you're in the meeting, you want to um, go in with a bit of a plan ahead of time. So if you're meeting the, the minister or the MP with a group of people, maybe delegate a lead person who's going to um, drive the meeting, lead the agenda and um, direct the conversation to relevant people as needed. It's useful to have an agenda set beforehand um, to keep you all on track and even potentially provide that agenda to the minister or the MP at the start of the meeting so that it's very clear to them, you know, how you want to spend their time. Often MPs can derail meetings um, by wanting to talk about their own interests. I've got into meetings myself with a very clear agenda and ended up having um, MP, MP, local MPs in particular talk to me for the length of their meeting about a local issue that they're concerned about, which while interesting is not the reason why I'm there and, um, you know, wastes my, my, my precious time, I'd say, um, you know, not getting to the point that I've I've got into the meeting for. So having an agenda is always useful. And then um, something else I normally do is have a short briefing note um, that I can give to them in the meeting and talk to, so they can kind of follow follow me through as I talk through the key issues. And there's that way you can provide some additional information from what you've included in your letter. Provide links to any other information that they might. Um, need to understand your concerns and it leaves them with something that they can look back on after the meeting um, in case that their note taking or their assistance note taking has been a little bit um, poor, I would say. Um, just on those briefing notes, though, you want to keep them clear and concise. They're not going to read pages and pages of material. You want to keep it short and you want to have your your key concerns and your key asks up front and clear so that they so that the key information is before them. Um, always be positive and good natured and uh, having a collaborative mindset or demonstrating that you're happy to work with people um, and examples of how you could work together, um, solutions to problems that you come to them with is always helpful and will help establish that relationship with them. The other thing to say is that it's really useful to um, build relationships, not just with the decision maker, the minister or the um, MP, but with their advisors, their diary managers, um, bureaucrats who might be advising them, um, because once you um, you establish those relationships, it's much easier to get, get in contact with them again, set up meetings, follow up meetings, send through information, etc. So those people can be a fantastic resource um, if you can if you can get in, um, in touch with them and develop that relationship as well. They also um, Find, I find it's helpful if you can provide some assistance to their office, MPs offices or ministers offices, for example, if you've got um, a new report out your organisation or you've um, seen a local media, media article about something you're, that you've spoken to them about previously or even some questions that they might be able to ask in the parliament, then sending that through um, to those offices can help. I know with some of the independents, for example, 
they've only got one or two staffers assisting them. So if you're able to draft up some questions that they can ask in Parliament or even some notes for a short speech that they can give in Parliament, then that's really appreciated by them. Um, you're helping them do their job and, um, and that's something that they would appreciate. Um, next slide, please, Sam. Just on that point, some other parliamentary tools that might be useful to consider, especially if you've got a, a relationship or you've met with an MP or a minister that, um, that's sympathetic to the concerns that you're raising, uh, is a private member's bill. So this is a bill that a, that a, um, a non-government member can introduce into the parliament. It's not always the case that the bill's going to pass through the parliament and be made into law. But having that bill on the Parliament's agenda is a good way to get key issues into the debate. You can get um, some broader attention in the community about the issues being proposed in the bill. It's a media off the back of the bill and it will be debated in the Parliament. Um, so that's one tool that you can discuss with, um, you know, an opposition member or a crossbench member about a way to bring um, issues before the Parliament. Um, EDO can provide some assistance in um, talking you through, you know, issues or ways in which legislation could be amended to address your concerns and you can then potentially take that to, to a private member to discuss turning into a bill. Other tools that are useful in the Parliament um, is question time or questions on notice. That's the ability for opposition members and the crossbench to ask questions directly to government. And so it's possible to suggest questions that can be asked um, either in question time or as a question on notice. And then the government's response can usually provide you a bit of intel about what's going on. Um, or, you know, if the government's reluctant to provide information or is a bit coy in their answers, then, you know, it gives um, both you and the opposition member or crossbench um, a platform to kind of push the government a bit more or put a bit more pressure on them. Similarly with Senate estimates or budget estimates, that's a really good time where you've got a minister on, um, you know, under oath giving evidence for hours on time and so working with the Senate committees um, to suggest questions etc that might be put to ministers is a way to try and get information from government to put pressure on them in relation to key issues and keep things on the, on the agenda in the parliament and in the community more broadly. Um, petitions is one other tool. Um, I think people on this call have probably seen the 20,000 plus signatures that were recently collected about um, native forest logging in New South Wales. I expect that some of you have signed it and MPA, um, you know, directed members to that petition. Um, it's going to be debated in Parliament in the coming weeks. So that's another way in which key issues can get um, put before the Parliament and, and um, promote a debate on, on certain key issues. Um, I think that's probably all I'm going to talk about in terms of the proactive tools. Um, there may have been some I've missed. So if there's anything you do want some information about, just let us know. But we might just move on now to some of the more reactive advocacy tools. Uh, so these are the types of things um, where, as I mentioned at the start, you're engaging in a process that's being run either by the parliament or by the government, and there's a clear formal process by which to engage. You're a bit tied to the government's agenda. That doesn't stop you, you know, using that agenda to, to raise um you know, broader issues as, as you see fit. So the first one I'm going to talk about is our parliamentary inquiries. So a parliamentary inquiry is tasked with investigating a particular topic and reporting back to the parliament. Um, inquiries are set up with terms of reference that guide the scope of the inquiry. Um, so recent examples of uh, inquiry inquiries that have been run through the parliament uh, is there's been a New South Wales parliamentary inquiry into the use of biodiversity offsets. There's been um, a parliamentary inquiry into the forest industry. That one, um, the committee delivered its report in the last week um, on that inquiry. Uh, similarly, parliamentary inquiries can happen at the federal level. Um, a recent example is the Duke and Gorge inquiry into the destruction of um, Aboriginal cultural heritage. 
So the committee will set up um, a formal process by which you can make submissions to the committee, and they may also invite you to address the inquiry at a public hearing. The hearings are conducted in public and are broadcast online, and the transcripts of those hearings are available um, on the Parliament website as well. So parliamentary inquiries, um, there's some pros and cons to getting involved with them, risks and opportunities. Some of them can be um, established by the parliament for you know, political reasons or a bit of witch hunting or because members of the crossbench or the opposition um, have a, a gripe that they want to you know, um, address within the, the committee process. Um, you may need to think about whether your engagement in the inquiry is worth your time um, and what uh, results you're hoping to get out of the inquiry. Other um, parliamentary inquiries are set up because there's a real public interest in the issue and getting involved and um, having your say and bringing issues to the attention of the committee and the community more broadly is a really useful thing to do. And there's a good chance that the committee will make some decent finding and recommendations that will be helpful in terms of the parliament in the parliament in considering the issue and in terms of any further advocacy that your group or others might want to do off the back of those findings and recommendations. So it's always good to have a think uh, up front um, before you engage in the inquiry about whether it's something um, that you think is a useful thing to do. Um, and again, uh, you can go onto the parliament website, have a look at previous inquiries, have a look at the way they work, the, the style that people put their submissions in the, um, into these inquiries, the types of questions that are asked during the public hearing, et cetera. Um, the next thing I'm gonna talk about, Sam, if you wanna move us on, is submission writing. It sounds like there was a bit of interest in this. Um, so submissions are a really common way for the public to have their say on a particular matter. So governments undertake public consultation across various processes and for various reasons. For example, they might consult on white papers proposing new policies or legislations. They might consult on draft bills or draft policies that they're proposing. Uh, public consultation may be required as part of the development application um, process or on plans of management for national park, et cetera. So often legislation will require the public consultation process to be undertaken um, in line with the legislative requirements, but also um, Governments might decide to undertake public consultation in their own right as a way of, you know, ensuring that there's transparent and open government and decision making processes. Either way, they're, they're useful to get involved in. I know a lot of people probably feel that um, there's lots of times that they're up late at night or um, spending most of their time writing submissions. It can be a bit draining, but it is a useful part of um, public participation in environmental and planning decision making. So we have a fact sheet on submission writing that you can get from our website. Um, there's a little QR code there on the screen. For those of you who are tech savvy, you should be able to hold your phone up to that QR code and it will link you directly to um, the EDO fact sheet that I'm talking to. But what I might do as well is just make sure that a copy or a link to that is um, given to Danielle and she can circulate that to, um, to the webinar participants afterwards as well. So the, um, the, web, the fact sheet covers off on everything that we're gonna go through here tonight. Um, so um, I'll just talk through it briefly and then you might be able to um, have a closer look at that fact sheet. So I think the key message is that there's no magic formula for writing a submission, but there are some things that you can do to make sure that it's an effective submission. You wanna make sure it's relevant. You wanna make sure that um, it's concise. You wanna make sure that your um, including as much evidence as you can to um, support the issues that you're raising, the asks and recommendations that you have. And you probably wanna have some key requests or asks in your submission. So the next little graphic that I'll get Sam to put up now, um, it's kind of a good one to explain the submission writing process. So hopefully you can all see that there. Um, so we've got our little koala on the screen and our koala wants to, um, have their say on making a submission. Um, so, sorry, I'm just trying to zoom in so I can see the text myself. Um, okay, so the first thing you want to do, step one, is introduce yourself or your group and note why you're interested in the subject matter. 
For example, we're the friends of the forest and we're interested in the proposal because we live in the path of the proposed road. Um, step two, you wanna outline your key concerns and focus your discussion on these. It's not always necessary to address the whole proposal. You can pick and choose the parts that are relevant to you and comment on those bits only. You're not expected to be the expert on everything. Um, for those of you who've kind of trawled through volumes of EIS documents yourself, um, it's not expected that you're over the entire content. What you should do is make sure that your submission addresses the concerns that are most important to you, the ones where you have the most information and evidence to put before the decision maker. Um, and it's okay to not address um, other aspects of a proposal as well. I should say that's probably the same advice um, in terms of parliamentary inquiries as well. Um, they'll have often broad um, terms of reference. You don't need to address all of the terms of reference. Just make it clear in your um, submission which ones you're addressing and stick to those and explain that you're not going to address the other terms of reference. Same thing with a submission on a particular government process. I'm writing one at the moment um, into the review on the, um, the Australian Carbon Credit unit, Units um, that, the, that Professor Chubb is undertaking. I'm definitely not an expert on um, the carbon market or um, carbon credits, but I'm focusing my submission on the key things that are of concern to EDO and which I think I can contribute to that, to that submission process. So step three, um, if possible, make recommendations in your submission about things that you think need to happen, things that you need think need to change with a certain proposal, things you think the decision maker can do. Um, I like to um, put my recommendations throughout my submission, but also just include a summary of my recommendations up front so it's really clear to the, um, to the person reading the submission what those recommendations are. Uh, step four, use evidence and case studies or stories to support your arguments. This is actually a really useful tool. Um, it helps explain your concerns in a really practical way. Um, a lot of the time, especially when I'm talking about laws or policies, it can be a bit dry. It can be a bit hard to explain the concerns that we've got or to help the decision maker understand why those concerns are important. So if you're able to throw in a case study that provides a real practical example of why, you know, why something's a concern or how a certain recommendation would have fixed a particular problem, then that's a really useful thing to include in your submission. And finally, step five, uh, don't forget to set out any positive aspects of the proposal. Um, there may be others who want to get rid of the aspects that you support. And so if you focus just on explaining all the things that are wrong with a particular proposal or a particular um, proposed law, um, the, the government or the decision maker, whoever it is, might think that there's not, not support for the good bits of it. So it's always useful to not only focus on what you think um, are the problems with something, but also point out the things that you support or the things that you think are good and should stay in there, particularly when you've got other stakeholders who are trying to, um, to make the case for removing things or changing things that you think actually are good. Um, I think that's probably all we need to say about that. Um, as I said, go um, to our fact sheet if you need more information on submission writing, or you can come back to this um, cute little graphic that we've got here, um, just for a um, step-by-step guide. Okay, Sam, um, I think the next slide was also a few more tips on your submission. Um, I think I've covered off on quite a few of them already. Uh, just make sure your submission is as clear and concise as possible. The shorter, the better. I always find that one a bit hard. I like to write a lot, but um, I think it's a really good point. Um, you know, people reading these um, submissions are reading lots of them. It takes a lot of time. It's probably very tiring for them. So um, brevity is can be your friend. Um, avoid using emotive or abusive language. It tends to just um, detract from your arguments. You want to, you know, Stay professional, stay on point um, if you can in your submission. Um, if your submission is a longer one, then think about including headings and page numbers. Consider a summary of your key points and recommendations up front. Make sure to include your name, contact details, and date of the submission. Often when you're um, 
lodging submissions online or providing them to government departments, they will ask you if you want your um, contact details to remain confidential. So there is the ability to elect that. But if you include your name and contact details, then um, the government agency can follow up if they have any questions or concerns about, about the information that you're providing or to discuss certain aspects of your submission with you, for example. Um, another key thing to do is ask for a response to your submission or even consider requesting a meeting with the relevant decision maker to follow up your concerns. This is something that we tend to do um, as practice, especially in relation to policy or law reform issues. If we're putting a submission in, then we often just say, look, we're happy to meet to discuss our submission in further detail. Um, sometimes decision makers like to do that, to talk through the issues or to put forward suggestions that they've got for improving things that we might not have thought about. Um, okay. The next um, slide, please, Sam. Just going to focus a bit more on how you might make a submission specifically in relation to a draft bill, a draft piece of legislation. So you might want to think about some things that are a little bit different to a submission on a development proposal or a policy, for example. Um, so other than the substantive points that I've already talked about, there are some additional things that you might want to think about when you're looking at draft legislation. For example, you might want to think about who is this legislation giving power to? Is the power with the appropriate minister? Should certain functions or powers under the draft legislation actually be carried out by an independent body or a scientific group? Does there need to be um, concurrence by another minister who might have um, similar portfolio interests. It's also use, it's always useful to kind of ask yourself those questions. I know, for example, um, last year, the Commonwealth government was putting forward a um, biodiversity market bill. It was pitched as an agricultural biodiversity market bill, and it was sitting under the agricultural minister to administer that draft legislation. But a lot of the key issues that were being addressed by the bill was in, it was in relation to biodiversity conservation and biodiversity outcomes. And so my view was that it was probably a good idea for the environment minister to have some role in that draft legislation, whether it be to administer the legislation as a whole or whether it was some kind of concurrence role in setting, you know, some of the methods and thing, um, other processes under the legislation. So it's also always useful to think about who's going to be, be administering the bill, who's going to have um, certain functions and roles under the legislation, and are there any suggestions you could make about strengthening, strengthening those um, rules? Also a good idea to check about whether the bill, within the bill there's appropriate checks on discretion. So are the decision-making criteria in the bill objective and specific, or is it giving the decision-maker really broad discretion and broad power to do things? Um, an example of this might be, um, for, exa uh, for example, if you've got a development application and the legislation quite clearly sets out, you know, a list of things that the, um, the decision maker needs to consider in assessing that development um, proposal, as opposed to something that might say, for example, the minister can, can do X and leaves it at that without kind of guiding how that decision um, needs to be made. So restraint on discretion or at least some objective criteria in the legislation is quite a useful safeguard to have um, when you're giving you know, powers to people under legislation. The next thing you might wanna ask is, is the legislation enforceable? If someone breaks the law, can the provisions of the law be enforced to remedy this? Often with um, environmental legislation, we also look at whether third parties are able to um, enforce the law or take certain action to remedy breaches of the law. Um, it's good practice in environment and planning decisions to have that third party oversight, but in some cases governments have tended to water down the ability of third parties to be involved in um, the enforcement of environmental law. So that's always a useful thing to check as well. Um, are the penalties for any breaches appropriate? That's another thing to think about when you're thinking about how the breaches of the law are going to be dealt with. You might also want to think about what role, what other opportunities are there for public participation? Is there a clear public um, consultation process required in the legislation? Is there um, an opportunity for people to make submissions to a proposal that's in the legislation? 
um, to appeal bad decisions? Uh, is there a requirement that the decision maker needs to consider the submissions? That's quite an interesting one because often legislation will have a process for community engagement, but there's nowhere, sometimes not a clear um, requirement that the decision maker has to consider those submissions. So when I'm talking about, you know, good processes and best practice for public consultation, having an, an explicit requirement for the decision maker to consider submissions that have been made is something that will strengthen legislation. Um, is there sufficient resourcing to, to implement the legislation? Um, sometimes the government might be proposing a whole new regime um, that's going to require people on the ground to properly implement. It's going to require people on the ground to have the relevant expertise. That might require um, resourcing of departments or capacity building within departments to be able to effectively implement and enforce the law. So even though it might not be something that's explicit in the legislation, it's always useful just to check what arrangements might be put in place concurrent with the legislation to resource the departments that are going to be in charge of administering the law. Um, another one that might seem pretty obvious, but is it understandable? Um, you know, people always complain that laws are complex and difficult to read and understand. So legislation really should be accessible to every member of the public. Um, so if you're um, reading a bill and you can't understand it, there's a good chance that someone else won't be able to either. So you can suggest to the government, you know, that there might be ways in which they can make the legislation clearer um, so that people understand how it can be, how it needs to be applied. Um, the last thing I've got here is just some advice from a bureaucrat. So um, a little while ago, when Jem was, you know, preparing um, the fact sheet that we've got on submission writing and turning her mind to what information might be useful for members of the community wanting to write submissions, she actually reached out to some bureaucrats and asked them, you know, what do you think makes a good submission? What can we tell the community they should do in terms of, you know, submission writing? So here's a bit of advice from some bureaucrats. Um, so writing submissions is not a popularity contest. Decision makers will take a good idea from one person over a bad idea from many people every day. Pro forma submissions can be effective at the start of a campaign, for example, if you're trying to change the views of politicians so that they understand the depth of feeling across a community that an idea is not supported or is supported, I guess. Um, however, you need to follow this up by writing your own submission to engage people and tell them what idea would be better. So pro forma is good early in the process and then um, more unique um, targeted written submissions later on. And some other advice, keep submissions on topic, give insights into analysis or experiences from elsewhere that make your case, point to innovative ideas, make your submission short and punchy, get the reader engaged early, be objective and outcome focused, have a civilized and interesting conversation, include a summary at the top of your submission, use headings within your submission to structure your argument, use clear language, one idea per paragraph, put your idea in the first sentence, then explain it in the rest of your paragraph. Think about your strategy, what's going to motivate people. Find that one's a little bit of a, you know, <laughs> writing 101, um, but hopefully there's some good tips in there for you. Um, just want to give, a, I know we're running out of time, so I'll try and move through this quickly, but I was just going to give a bit of an example on submission writing um, case study. Uh, the one Jem suggested we use here is about marine park rules. Um, and so just moving on, Sam, um, you probably already know that the New South Wales government is developing a network management plan for five mainland marine parks in New South Wales. So Cape Byron, Solitary Islands, Port Stephens, Great Lakes, Service Bay and Batemans. Um, the, proce the process involves two stages. Um, stage one um, is the developing the management plan. Um, that, that stage happened earlier in the year with submissions closing, uh, I think that was in January. Um, so the plan identifies um, environmental, social, cultural and economic values of the park, sets out the management objectives and actions required to reduce priority threats to those values. Um, the thing that the that plan didn't do was it didn't go into the specific details on rules or zones. So that is going to happen in stage two of the process. 
So stage two is where they're going to be um, developing the rules, including zoning, to implement the actions that were set out in the plan. Um, my understanding is that that's going to be open for public comment soon. So just moving on. Um, so Jem, I think, mentioned last week that when you're looking at, um, you know, government consultation material, the devil is always in the detail. And this is the same case for these management zones. So um, we don't know what the New South Wales rules are going to look like yet. But on this slide is an example of the marine park zoning, for the Temperate East Marine Park Network, which is part of the Federal Marine Park Network. And you can see in there, it's quite detailed. You've got all these boxes and tables kind of explaining what you can and can't do in certain areas. So there's quite a lot of information in there. Um, and so respond, you know, breaking that down and responding to that, um, you know, is a bit of a challenging task, I think. Um, so on the assumption that the New South Wales rules would be um, similarly structured or, you know, kind of going to that level of detail, we've got a bit of suggestion about how you might want to approach a submission. If you want to move on to the next slide there. Thanks, Sam. Um, so we've outlined a potential way that you might want to structure a, a submission on those marine park rules. Uh, I think the key message from Jem is to um, support the stuff you don't like and to suggest strengthening the bits that you don't. Um, so the first thing you want to do in your submission, um, if you remember back to step one that those koalas did, you need to interest, introduce yourself and your group and outline why you're interested in marine park management and having your say on the rules. Then you want to go through and uh, list your concerns. Um, it could be a specific, for example, a concern could be that there's a specific area that is zoned to allow inappropriate activity and you don't agree with that. So then the next thing you want to do is make a recommendation um, about how that might be changed. So, for example, you might want to recommend that a different type of zone is applied over the area or that you might want to recommend alternatively that certain uses are um, prohibited from use in that zone. Um, then you want to provide some evidence as to why you think that that's a concern and why you've made the recommendation that you have. This could be data showing the number of important species and ecosystems that inhabit a zoned area, for example. And then you want to repeat that process for each of your concerns. So this is my concern. This is my recommendation for what needs to change. This is the evidence that I'm providing you to support that recommendation. Um, and then just remember that you also want to point out the bits of the proposal that you do support. So if there's bits of the rules that you think um, should be there, particularly where you think that other stakeholders might be pushing against those rules, you want to clearly state in your submission that you actually do support um, those things. It's a bit hard to kind of talk about it in the abstract, but that's kind of the general process that, that we suggest for, um, you know, making a submission where it where you need to kind of step through the detail. Um, yeah, I think the last point I've already made, so just be aware that there will be people um, making submissions that don't necessarily agree with you. So always make sure you say the bits that you do like and support as well. Um, all right, Sam, EPBC Act Reform, I'm just gonna quickly talk about this. Um, the most of you know that where the government, the new Labor government has committed to reforming our national environmental laws. If you want to kind of know where things are up to, you can go onto our EDO website. Um, our head of policy, Rachel Wormsley, has got a um, you know some blogs and legal updates on there that's kind of sets out what's happened to date. But I guess the main point now is that the federal government has committed to providing a full response to the independent review of the EPBC Act. That's the Samuel Review. I think they've said they'll do that by the end of this year. They, they've committed to establishing an independent national EPA, which is something that many environment groups have called for. And so that's going to, they're going to start um, the process of establishing that meeting with stakeholders, putting forward a draft proposal um, soon. They're going to continue working with stakeholders throughout the reform process. And they've committed to do a separate review of Aboriginal cultural heritage laws. Um, so we've been invited to participate throughout that process as we have done in the past. So we're happy to keep the community updated on opportunities to have a say um, and also share our own analysis when the time comes. All right, I think um, just to recap, we've gone through some of the proactive advocacy tools um, they're like nominations, asking the ministers to call in a project, meeting with politicians, 
and using those parliamentary tools such as private member bills, questions on notice and petitions. And we've talked a bit about the reactive advocacy and in particular submission writing. So now I think I'm ready to hand back to you, Danielle. Um, I can see there's been some things coming into the chat. Um, hopefully we can, we've got some time left to talk to some of those now. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. I hope that everyone found that useful. Um, I noticed that Gary um, is really keen to, to ask you a very um, specific, question, specific question around 30 by 30. And I know that he's thinking um, about 30 by 30 because he will be one of the first people to put together a submission um, in terms of trying to expand sanctuary protection uh, in our marine park. So yeah, it's a great question. Um, we know that the Commonwealth Government has supported 30 by 30. Uh, so does this mean that state environment, that the state environment ministers must also align to this Commonwealth commitment? So any tips and advice um, for Gary when he's writing his mission uh, in regards to that question? Mm -hmm. It's a good question, Gary. Um... I think it's a bit unclear exactly how um, that 30 by 30 commitment is going to be implemented and whether it's something that the, um, that the government will try and lead on and bring states and territories with them or whether they expect state and ter territories to do their own thing or what role the state and territories are going to have. And I think um, now's the time to be putting forward your thoughts on how that might be achieved. Um, and then there's probably a little bit of the proactive and the reactive to be involved here. I think it's still early stages. So you're probably gonna to wanna to think about doing some of the proactive stuff, like getting in to see um, both the federal minister and the relevant state ministers to um, let them know what you think they should be doing to meet that 30 by 30 target. And then there's probably going to be at some point um, a process, and I don't actually know the details myself, um, but I expect that definitely the federal government and maybe state governments as well may want to um, put in place new policies or legislation to, to realise that target. And so there'll be an opportunity to have your say then. I'm just trying to give you a real practical example. I'm working on a, um, a report at the moment. It's coming out of our work on defending the unburnt with WWF. And we're looking at ways to protect unburnt areas and we're looking the report specifically on environmental stewardship and what what um, governments could be doing to improve environmental stewardship so that there's more um, private land conservation for example to protect unburnt areas but the point that I'm, I'm making um, that I've made in my draft is that um, that's also a good opportunity to align with 30 by 30. So you know one of the things I'm recommending is that um, there's already existing private land conservation programs. You know, the BCT runs one in New South Wales. Landholders can enter into conservation agreements. We should be using that mechanism and um, bolstering it and targeting it at unburnt areas because they're really important, um, you know, in, in terms of recovery from bushfires. And that will also help the government meet its 30-30 target. Um, so trying to think about ways so in that example I was trying to think about ways where I could I was making a recommendation that was probably at the start unrelated to 3030 but I was able to kind of make that link and I think it's kind of thinking about opportunities in everything you do as to how you can bring it back to, to that commitment that the government's made I hope that's answered your question happy to talk about it more if you need fantastic um, and Gary, uh, just in relation to your second question, which you um, already probably know, um, it's another opportunity um, for us in terms of pushing for that 30 by 30 target. Yes, go for 30% sanctuary of all New South Wales waters. That's what um, the local marine scientists are saying in New South Wales. Um, okay, we'll move on to some of the other questions. Um, Susan has asked, should, should you first contact the department before going to the minister otherwise the minister may just refer you to the department question mark what do you think <laughs> um good question I'm not sure exactly what context you're talking about there Susan Susan was it is it in relation to a um a development proposal or um the call-in powers um I'm just gonna 
I might address both. Um, if it's in relation to a development proposal, um, then yes, the, the minister might just refer you to the department, um, but you're at least bringing it to the minister's attention that it's something that, that um, that's a concern to the community and something that they might want to um, be briefed on by the department as to why they've got constituents or members of the community reaching out to them. Um, why is this a concern? What do I need to know? Um, is there a problem? Um, I don't think I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. Um, I think it's on a case by case basis. You might have tried working with the department or you know engaging with the department and not got anywhere, so you might decide to go to the minister. Or you might think the issue is so important that you want to bring it to the minister's attention because you don't think the department's, you know, paying attention to um, to whatever the concern is. So I don't think there's a right or wrong answer in that one. You are right that there's a risk the minister is just going to fob you back off to the department, but at least you know you've put it on their radar. Um, even if they don't, agree, if the minister doesn't agree to meet with you, you've at least um, you know, put it front and centre of their mind that there's some concerns about whatever the issue is and that they need to be paying attention and paying attention to what the department's doing. Uh, and you could also just try asking uh, the minister's advisor for a meeting as well if the minister's too busy. Um, and uh, we have a question from Tim. Um, how Tim has asked, how can I find out what zoning a particular piece of land is? This would be with the aim of rezoning for an environmental protection. So I guess yeah. the proposal he has in mind. Yeah, so uh, land is um, zoned through um, a local council's local environment plan. And they've normally got um, maps that underpin that plan where you can go on and see um, what the zone is for the for that area. So you'll need to know um, where, the, if, if you've got a specific parcel of land in mind, you'll need to know where that is. I think these days you should be able to go onto the New South Wales legislation website, click into um, the section that's got local environment plans and most of them now should have the maps online as well. I know back in the day it was a bit clunky and they didn't all have maps online and it was very hard to do. But um, from my experience recently, you should be able to find those zoning maps online now um, sitting under local environment plans. The other place you might be able to find those maps is on the relevant council's website as well. Um, Hopefully that's answered your question. I think we probably have a fact sheet that might explain that process. So I'll see if I can dig it up. Fantastic. Um, yeah, send that through to us once you've got that and we'll send it on to everyone. Um, Tim has also asked, do you have any views on engaging the media? So I guess he's asking what sort of materials do you think, um, I guess um, in, in relation to a campaign, what sort of materials do you think or information you need prior to engaging the media? Mm, good question. Um, I'm not a media expert. Um, I'm not a campaign expert. Um, but I think media can sometimes be a useful tool to use as part of your broader range of strategies. So, you know, something that you've got in your toolbox in addition to meeting with ministers, making submissions, et cetera. I don't think, again, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer about the way you approach media. Um, people will use it, um, media in different times for different reasons. As I said, just have it in your toolbox as a potential tool. I think that um, it, dep it depends really what you're trying to achieve, but um, often journalists find backgrounding information useful. And so if you've got... Um, you know, sometimes even giving them a submission that you've written or, um, you know, a briefing note that you might have prepared for the minister, but explains, obviously explains clearly the concern, providing that, you know, to a journalist as a way of background information can be helpful. Um, I guess the point is, if you want to get your story in the media, the more assistance you can provide, the better. Um, because journalists, like all of us, you know, are pressed for time. Um, they can't they don't necessarily have the time or the skills to dig into the detail. So, you know, the more information you can give them, that's easy to process and will get them across the issue that you're concerned about quickly, um, the more likely they are to take on a story and, you know, you'll have some more media success. Um, but again, caveat, I'm not a media expert. <laughs> 
Um, and just a, another quick tip, um, maybe just wait to, to see what happens with your meeting with the, the minister of the department. Um, if he doesn't respond, then that might be a reason to, to go to the meeting. Or maybe you're not happy with the response that the minister has given. So I'm going to wrap it up now because we're reaching eight o'clock. Um, but thank you so much for joining us tonight, Sarah. And it was such a wonderful presentation and you're getting a lot of thank yous in, in the chat. So um, yeah, I think you must have covered everything um, because everyone seems quite happy with uh, the presentation tonight. So thank you. Uh, is there any final words you'd like to say, Sarah, before we wrap up to everyone? No, just thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks for um, bearing with me as I was thrown at the last minute with Jem being unwell. Um, but do please reach out to EDO um, if you've got any questions. And if there's anything that I've promised I'd send through that I haven't, then just chase up Danielle and she should um, be able to get it off me and get it to you. Wonderful. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye.